welcome, welcome to AUDL Weekly. Good to see you again for the show all about ultimate stories, perspectives, conversations, and more. And tonight we recap week two of the AUDL season, another batch of exciting and surprising results this past weekend. My name is Evan Leffler, and coming up on the show tonight, Colorado Summit co-head coach Mike Lunn stops by to reminisce about their remarkable two-win weekend. Of course, Adam and Daniel are back for another spirited disc debate. And then Matt Smith has his former teammate and current New York Empire star Antoine Davis for a brand new upline and out of bounds. But first, wonderful night for a toss. So hope you'll settle in. You're watching AUDL Weekly on AUDL.TV. So stick around. All right, welcome back. Ten games across the league this past weekend, and most of them went right down to the wire. Wildest finish, of course, transpiring in Portland, Oregon, Sunday night, where the Colorado Summit get the goal in double OT to win 24-23 in an absolutely insane finish. Both overtimes were battled amidst a vicious monsoon, and the conditions created a bunch of unclutch, uncharacteristic moments until Jonathan Nethercutt hit Matthew Agee for the game clincher. Shout out though to Portland's Daniel Lee for one of the most memorable points we've seen in the AUDL in a long time. It was an O point for the Nitro. Colorado had three separate chances to break for a three goal lead, but Daniel Lee with three different blocks and ultimately Portland scored to get back within one. Nitro though do fall to one and one after their first two games. While Colorado joins Salt Lake at 2-0 atop the West Division. Summit's first win, of course, coming on Saturday in Seattle. And Matthew Agee, who had the game winner on Sunday with the Sports Center top 10 moment on Saturday. One of the many great highlights in the Summit's first weekend as an AUDL franchise. It was impressive and fun to watch. Also 1-1 one one in the West now after their win over Oakland this past Saturday. The San Diego Growlers winning 19-16 up in the Bay. Growlers will look to get above 500 when they host LA this Saturday. Elsewhere around the league, Chicago outlast the Minnesota Windchill by handling the Minnesota Wind Gusts a little bit better than the Windchill did on Saturday. 24-21 was the final. Union now 2-0 after the impressive road win to spoil the chill season opener in St. Paul. Meanwhile, in Madison, the Radicals become the first franchise in AUDL history with 100 wins. They never trailed on Saturday in their 18-16 win over Pittsburgh, dropping the Thunderbirds to 0-3. And 1-0 Madison will face 1-0 Indy coming up this weekend after the Alley Cats stomp Detroit 33-22 inside Grand Park. Keegan North, a gigantic game in his return to Indianapolis after he played last season as a member of the Chicago Union. Meanwhile, East Division drama with all three games in the Northeast decided by four or fewer. We had Ottawa over Boston 21-19 on Friday, and then Montreal also knocking off the glory 21-17 on Saturday afternoon. Tough weekend for the glory with two losses north of the border and another challenge beckoning in week three with New York making the drive up by 95 to Massachusetts. And of course the Empire are now 2-0 following up their week one win over DC with a week two victory over Philadelphia. 17-15 New York over Philly. Low scoring affair, but a win's a win for the Empire as they drop the Phoenix to 0-2. I am very intrigued about the first game on the week three schedule set for 7 p.m. this Friday night. 0-2 Philly hosting 2-0 Montreal. I got a hunch that's gonna be a very competitive game. It is the Royale's first trip to the US since 2019. And in the South Division, Atlanta, Austin, and Dallas were all off this past weekend. So the only South Division action featured Carolina moving to 2-0 with a 19-13 triumph over Tampa Bay. Carolina will be considerable favorites against the Cannons again when they meet in Durham this coming weekend. And then after that, the Flyers will face the Austin Soul. That'll be a week from Friday in another game that I'm very much looking forward to. In week four, Austin at Carolina on Friday, and then Atlanta in the game of the week 
on that Saturday. All right, that's the rundown for week two. Obviously headlined by Colorado's two wins on the road. And when we come back, Summit coach Mike Lunn will break down his team's exciting AUDL debut performance. That's next as we roll along here on AUDL Weekly. Back here on AUDL Weekly with one of the co-coaches of the Colorado Summit, Mike Lund, joins us after a 2-0 weekend through Seattle and Portland. Mike, congratulations on the 2-0 start to the Summit's tenure in the league. Uh, how you feeling uh, coming off this great weekend? Uh, feeling great. I, you know, tired. I uh, just mentioned I we flew back late uh, I think we boarded at one o'clock last night, Seattle time, and got home uh, around 4.30, 4.40. And uh, so we're, I think we're all running on fumes, but yeah, could be happier with the results uh, from the weekend. Yeah, it's Monday afternoon as we chat, and folks will hear this on Wednesday night on AUDL Weekly. Uh, appreciate you making the time despite the fatigue. Uh, through, the, through the exhaustion, I imagine the exhilaration from the two wins still stands out uh let's talk big picture like what stood out from the weekend as a whole before we dive into some specific moments from the two games um i think the biggest thing is you know learning how to play with each other and also learning how to play in the audl uh we, we definitely have a handful of um solid savvy veterans on the team who bring a lot of experience but for a lot of us including the entire coaching staff well I, that's not true ryan has has played in the adl uh, but tk and i have not we don't have any experience so getting used to the the refs the pace of of everything and and what kind of calls are, are going to be made or, or not made uh was certainly something to get used to well, it began on Saturday night in Seattle and, you know, kind of like Salt Lake. I mean, they fell behind early a little bit. You guys were down 4-2 in the opening quarter. How long did it take your your, your guys and your coaching staff to kind of feel comfortable and, and let your talent go to work and seize control of that game against the Cascades? Yeah, you know, uh, the Seattle Stadium, is the wind is a little swirly. Um, and actually, Jay knew about this going into the game had he, had, since he had played there uh, previously. Uh, I do think that, you know, had a little bit of, of early effects on, 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 our, on our guys. But, uh, you know, I don't even think it was an AEDL thing. It was just kind of how ultimate goes. You know, sometimes you fall, fall behind. and uh, But, you know, we never really felt... Um, uncomfortable i suppose we we're just sort of settling into things at that point what was ultimately the difference against seattle in terms of you guys pulling away and, and getting the w in your first ever game um you know a few things you know uh seattle was you know to be honest missing a few a few guys i think they had uh northwest college regional so uh, a few guys that we had been planning for were not playing that game um so that always helps but you know we have a good team. Honestly, we have, we have we have a pretty deep team. Uh, I think we're going to get continue to get deeper throughout the season and uh, just getting more reps together, gelling. Uh, nothing complicated. It was just just getting time together and, and playing how we've been practicing. There's no question you guys have a bunch of star players from Jonathan Nethercutt and Jay Frude and Matt Jackson who have the experience in the league to, you know, the University of Colorado contingent that you've coached with Mama Bird that's, you know, just kind of coming onto the national stage at this level. So you win on Saturday and then you, you travel south to Portland. How were the bodies feeling? How was everyone physically heading into the game with the Nitro? Obviously, they're fresh, and you guys are coming off a game less than 24 hours earlier. Yeah, you know, not too bad. Uh, so Saturday, we, we we actually flew out to Seattle early Saturday. So that, that day was almost tougher in some ways because of the, the long travel, lack of sleep going into the day. But we were able to get... A uh, good rest Saturday night and, and hit the road at a reasonable time, like 9 a.m. Pacific time to get to Portland. Uh, so we were feeling good, honestly. We had, uh, you know, some some nicks here and there, but uh, 
uh, Seattle was really like, uh, because of the travel, we, we were cramping by the end of the game, but um, the weather kind of turned out for the beginning of the Portland game, and I think mood the mood was good. Uh, the captains led us through a really solid warm-up, um, and then towards the end of the game, obviously the rain became a factor, but yeah, yeah, we, uh, we knew it was going to be tough, right? Back-to-back. Uh, tough opponent on a back-to-back is always, you know, not ideal, but yeah, yeah, we felt good about it. Was there any part of you, maybe not even the coaching staff or the team, that was like, all right, we got the win on Saturday, we're playing with house money a little bit, no one expects us to go 2-0 and in this first weekend? Oh, no. yeah, we never, definitely never thought of it that way. Um, you know, we, we watched, we had the advantage of having been able to watch Seattle and Portland play last week. So kind of had some, uh, ideas of, of, of how we wanted to match up against Portland. Um, and you know, like, honestly, I felt, I really felt good about our matchups throughout the game. You know, Leandro actually made a ton of great plays, even though like I thought we, we were covering him well, but he was able to draw contact, which, you know, was a little frustrating on our side, but credit to him to make those making those plays. And uh, uh, Daniel Lee, that guy just blew up and <laughs> made a ton of amazing plays. Which, yeah, I I, I guess you just kind of got to give him credit. I felt like we could have put that game away at a couple different moments, and we just we just didn't execute in certain situations, and they just kept hanging around. Uh, but yeah, I felt I felt great about you know TK's. He sort of takes the uh, the defensive um, uh, part of our schemes, and and he had a great game plan for our guys, and I thought they executed it pretty well. Yeah, you said it well because you guys had a lot of break opportunities to to really put them away and create some separation, and like their O line guys, including Daniel Lee, kept making some spectacular blocks to prevent you guys from getting the breaks. How, how was the was the frustration building up on the sidelines when you guys couldn't convert those and, and it was heading to overtime and then double OT and you guys still hadn't finished them off? Um, you know, I, actually, I think uh, Mo Scott, uh, he's one of our D-line guys um, who I've coached against for a long time when he was at CSU. Uh, he said he said something really really uh, pertinent. I think Saturday night, and, and that like we were super supportive of each other Saturday at Seattle. And, and he said, you know, that's that's it's really easy to do when you're when you're winning, and and we have to make sure we're, we're able to do that, you know, in, in tougher times. And um, certainly there was some frustration. Obviously, we wanted to put some of those goals away, even even on those long old points for Portland that we didn't get the break, we still felt like we were winning the points, uh, but then they just kept hanging around. Uh, but yeah, I think Mo said it best the night before. Uh, and, and I think his words sort of rang true throughout the, uh, the game Sunday and we were, we were able to stick together. You sure were. Uh, we may have buried the lead a little, a little bit. We should have just talked about, you know, the overtime right off the top. It's, so it's it's 23 all, and you guys are going back and forth, and each team has chances to score, and great players are dropping the disc in the end zone. Like, what were the conditions like in those climactic moments, and how did you all stay together? Uh, just, like, t- take me through the roller coaster that, the overtime was from your perspective uh yeah definitely a little stressful the rain i don't know how well it came uh through on the camera but it, it started downpouring pretty heavily and the wind started picking up uh honestly like just everything was was pretty difficult to to complete towards the end of the game and i was you know just kind of I had faith that you know we, we were putting them in tough situations to, to complete passes and um, ultimately it just kind of came down to who could make a play at the end of the game and fortunately we were able to do that the double overtime point you guys pulled at the start and you, you get the turn and then you get it right back and and then uh, Alex Tatum uh, you know after I think dropping the disc makes the block that leads to the nether cut throw to, to win the game, I believe to uh, AG. Uh, 
I mean, what does it say about Tatum and kind of his presence and leadership to get that disc back for you? If he doesn't make that last play, uh, we could say this about a number of plays over the course of the game and the weekend, but he doesn't make that play. You guys might not be 2-0 and right now. Sure. Yeah, Tatum is a gamer. We always talk about that. You know, he he's sort of an unconventional player. Uh, that last sequence, though, really starts with Cody Spicer's defense on uh, Rafi and the resets. Uh, that, that sort of our bread and butter what we like to do and try to make tough and uh put put them in a tough situation to, to squeeze that throw in and, and yeah tatum was able to to get a hand on that one uh, yeah but both those guys really what i love about them is when everybody else is completely gassed they're able to just mentally fight through and, and keep grinding So what was the main message from the coaching staff and the leaders after you wrapped up the win? I mean, it was a emotional, exciting weekend and, uh, you know, but you're two and oh, you're not 12 and oh, you haven't made the playoffs yet. And, uh, all you did was match what Salt Lake did the previous week. Yeah, so yeah. how'd you guys set the tone for going forward? Uh, you know, uh, we were, I think we were just having fun. Um, when we went to overtime in the huddle, Nut, Nut said, um, like, how, how many times do you get to do this play uh, in a stadium like that, in these conditions, you know, in an overtime game? Um, so I think that everybody was just enjoying the moment, having fun together. And, uh, you know, like, again, like, this was sort of a new experience for, for most of us, the, AD, the AUDL piece of it. And that was sort of it. It was just fun. Um, the guys... I went and hung out with my family afterwards, but uh, the guys celebrated a little bit before we, we, we caught our flight home. And, and uh, I, I think that's sort of the story going forward. We, we The first day of tryouts, uh, we, we talked about, you know, finding your joy and um, just having fun uh, playing your style of ultimate while, you know, obviously we want people to be able to fit into what we're trying to do, but ultimately that comes down to like, what it is that makes this game joyful for you. That's pretty cool. And yeah, obviously you want to make sure everybody's having fun, but you guys have a lot of talent and, and can win a lot of games as well. My last question is this, did, did this past weekend redefine your expectations at all, either for how many games you can win or what your potential could be as a group this season? Uh, I don't, you know, honestly, I don't think so. Uh, uh, you, I'm not really thinking too far ahead. We're, we're, we're just trying to keep getting better each day at practice and, and, and learning as we go. Um, the, the first time I, 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 or when I first joined the team, you know, it was, it's all about building culture in year one. Obviously we want to do well. We want to be competitive. All of us are competitive people and, and the whole idea is to compete at the highest level uh, that we can. But yeah, it's just about building. Uh, expectations are exactly the same today as they were, you know, 72 hours ago. Good deal. Mike Lund, appreciate the time. Best of luck going forward. And I look forward to seeing you down the road. Thanks, Evan. It's Mike Lunn, one of the three co-head coaches of the Colorado Summit. They are tied for first place entering week three in the AUDL. Adam and Daniel back to break down everything from the past weekend in the American Ultimate Disc League as we continue on AUDL Weekly right after this. It's time for Toss Up here on AUDL Weekly. It's my privilege to welcome back Adam Ruffner and Daniel Cohen. You can hear these guys on the Swing Pass podcast twice a week, wherever you get your podcasts. Adam and Daniel, welcome. Uh, Daniel, let's start with you this week. Toss Up. All right. Topic number one. Uh, who's more likely to win the West? 2-0 Salt Lake or 2-0 Colorado? 
Uh, I go so back and forth on this one because Colorado, it feels like because they have the AUDL experience in guys like John Nethercutt and Jay Frude, like and Dave Wiseman too, like really experienced AUDL vets, Matt Jackson, just while I'm listing guys. It still felt like I saw more consistency out of Salt Lake in their opening weekend. So I might ever so slightly lean Salt Lake. I think maybe it's the scoring efficiency that we saw from them, scoring 25 and then 24 goals in that opening weekend. We saw Colorado look generally good, but also kind of run into some spells of, of a bit turnover heavy play. I mean, particularly at the end of the Portland game, I feel like they had more sort of expansion team moments whereas Salt Lake felt a lot more polished. It's still super early. I could see either one of these teams getting to the top, but right now I, I think I, I lean very slightly in Salt Lake's favor. Heck of a hedge. I might ever so slightly lean towards Salt Lake. <laughs> the tiniest uh, bit. Adam, be more declarative. Who's gonna win the West, Salt Lake <laughs> or Colorado? As impressive as Colorado was this past weekend, winning both of their road games similar to Salt Lake, I'm with Daniel, and I'm going to stick with kind of the, the wave I was riding last week with the shred, and I'm going to go with Salt Lake right now. I just think that having talked to their captains last week on Swing Pass, having heard from head coach Bryce Merrill for Salt Lake, there is an application to the details with the shred team that... I don't know that you will really see outside of San Diego in the West this season. They are going home and preparing every single game. They are pr taking practices very seriously. They're working as a one through 27 kind of lineup team. I just trust that over the length of the regular season. Now, when it comes to the playoffs, it will be interesting to see who emerges. But for right now, I like Salt Lake winning the regular season in the West. It's funny how quickly things can change from a narrative standpoint because everyone was talking, you know, Colorado or Portland or San Diego, and now you both choose the shred. We'll see them this Friday night in their home opener against Seattle. All right, topic number two. Uh, who was more impressive, Adam, in their debut with their new team this past weekend? Jonathan Nethercut with the Summit or Dalton Smith with Chicago Union? Now, this isn't to say that John Nethercutt isn't impressive wherever he performs, but I think we're kind of seeing that this is what Nutt does regardless of what team you put him on. He played for three games with San Diego last year. He stepped in, looked exactly like his MVP self. He comes into his first two games with Colorado. He puts up over a thousand throwing yards and 13 assists in two games, and is just the quarterback that this expansion team needs. So. I'm, I'm not trying to say that isn't impressive, but just for the kind of heightened atmosphere, the, the I think heightened stakes of the game itself, I'm gonna pick Dalton Smith's debut at Chicago in that Minnesota game. Quarterbacking that D-line, having not really played or practiced with that union team yet, very consistently, and just stepping in and being an anchor for their counterattack all night long in the win, I, that was something that I knew Dalton was capable of, but watching him do it, it just really secured in my mind of how he deserves to be in a class of like a Eric Taylor or um, I'm struggling to think of other two-way player names, but that, that kind of true all ADL, the stats might not always indicate it, but game in, game out, he is going to provide you a star caliber performance. I was just so impressed with Dalton's ability to lead the Union D-line. Daniel, what do you think? Gonna agree. I mean, Dalton, look, coming into the game, I thought, no Paul Arders. Dalton will probably slot in on offense. Like, he is that very capable hybrid that should be able to slot into whatever system. But I, I'm, like, so sold on Dalton leading the D-line. Like, this is something we talked about before the season a bunch. Like, who is gonna lead this D-line with their off-season losses of... Peter Graffy, Kirk Gibson, Drew Swanson, like they were lacking defensive playmakers. And I feel like Dalton Smith has just like put any doubts I had aside. He is such a good quarterback for this D-line. He had 31 completions in this game, which was third most on the team, despite playing 16 of his 18 points on defense. 
He had another three blocks. He had no throwaways. His only incompletion was a drop. Like, I, I don't know. I was just blown away by him. I love the fit for this defense. I liked him better back there than either of their main D-line handlers last season. So I, I just think it's such a nice fit. Again, not to take anything away from John Nethercutt, but I was most surprised by Dalton's ability to just immediately slot in and be a difference maker. Yep, Dalton was good. And the biggest surprise for me was that Chicago was able to win that game without Paul Arters and also Eli Artemakis. They were shorthanded and they still went in there and handled the elements better and got the win. And Dalton was a huge part of that. All right, uh, moving on. Topic number three. Uh, Daniel, we'll start with the guy that's not wearing the Radicals jersey. Uh, who you got on Saturday in Indy? Madison or the Alley Cats? I mean... This, this could very well be overreacting to Indy's week one performance against Detroit, but I think it served as a reminder of how good this team can play indoors and how, how at home it feels for them, especially for a guy like Keegan North, who just blew the roof off uh, the Indy Alley Cats home field this past weekend, putting up 14 scores, I believe 900 total yards or something ridiculous. I'm gonna take Indy, I think Madison, I, I liked the direction we saw from their offense in the first week, but at the same time, their defense out-converted their O-line again. And that was the same thing we saw last season. They ended up with a higher D-line conversion percentage than their O-line conversion percentage. Until I see more consistency from the Radicals offense, I don't know, the, the indoor game is very offense heavy. And right now, even without Travis Carpenter, it feels like Indy is gonna be in a good spot to put up a lot of points. Adam, break it down for us. The Rads or the Cats? Who you got? Uh, I, I don't know. Take a guess. Uh, <laughs> first off, congratulations to the Madison Radicals whole organization and fan base for reaching the 100 win mark. Uh, first team to do it in AUDL history. Uh, I got to do the play-by-play -play, luckily enough for it, so I just wanted to give a shout out and admit a little bit of my bias going into this question. Um, I did think Indy was super impressive last week. Obviously, the return of Keegan North is huge for this team, particularly with the season-ending injury of Travis Carpenter. They are going to lean on him a ton. I do agree that the indoors environment is going to favor Indy's offense. I just think that Madison's defense is still going to be able to take away the first opportunity looks that the Alley Cats like to engage and force them into some alternate routes, which I think will favor the Radicals in the long run of this game. Now, I have heard that Madison might be missing some key components, particularly on offense going into this matchup, which may have a pretty particular effect on the outcome, but I still have faith in this Madison defense right now, particularly as it battles for that third seed in the Central. I just think defense wins you games, and until Indy can show a little bit more of something against a non-Detroit team, I'm going to take the Radicals. <laughs> yeah, Indy has not beaten anyone besides Detroit since their division title game three years ago at this point. Hey, Adam, real quick, who on the Madison defense do you think guards Keegan North primarily on Saturday? I mean, I think historically it's been Kevin Pettit-Scantling versus Keegan North, but I could definitely see Luke Marks drawing that matchup and a couple of the other younger guys that the team is really excited about. Jake Rubenmiller might get a couple of shots at him. We'll see. I think you might see a few different defenders on North just giving him different looks and trying to disrupt his rhythm because as Daniel was pointing out, the dude went supernova the other night. Yeah. Tough news for the Radicals with Kevin Brown tweaking the hamstring again. Oh. Sorry to hear that news. And KB likely done for the year, we are told. So that's a that's a tough punch across the face for the Radicals and their hopes to have a top defense, even though they'll still be good. All right, topic number four, moving on from Madison. Uh, I, I'm curious where you guys go with this question. Adam, we'll start with you. Which 0-1 team currently has the best chance to make championship weekend, or I should say the better chance to make championship weekend. The Minnesota wind chill or the DC breeze? No, I'm not saying I'm selling all my stock in Minnesota after losing one game by three goals at home where they did hold a lead at times on Chicago, but 
I think that loss confirmed a lot of the fears I had about this windshield team, about how all the pieces fit together. It felt like they got a few good performances from around the team in Tony Paletto and Quinn Snyder's return. He looked phenomenal, but it never felt like they were truly playing cohe cohesive ultimate. And you could see that in contrast with Chicago, who looked like the most with it together cohesive team in the division right now. They are the reigning champs. And so I think I'm a little bit more hesitant on Minnesota right now. And I still think DC looked really good against New York and New York pitched their A game in that week one matchup. DC stuck with them the whole time. I still think DC is going to develop over the season and Minnesota will too. I just think DC has shown an ability to consistently push New York as good as any team in this league, and they're going to continue to do that even into a playoff matchup with them this year. And right now, I still think in the Central, it's Chicago's to lose, as they showed this last weekend. Daniel, what do you think? I think I'm going the other way on this one, and Ooh. a lot of that is because we saw New York's A game in week one, and it's just like, how does any team beat that? And sure, there's a chance if they play DC in the playoffs that maybe they have an off night, but I I feel like I, I still favor New York in that playoff environment. Whereas with Minnesota, I feel like we've been talking a lot about with their new additions, it's likely that it will take some time to really figure out their rotations, really optimize the usage of a lot of their new guys, guys like Abe Coffin, Rami Paus. They were also missing a couple key handlers in Will Brandt and Andrew Roy. So I think later in the season, as they get more more full strength and just have their depth all together, I'm not too worried about them. I still think they've got as good a shot as Chicago of coming on top of the Central Division. Chicago will also be picking up some people later in the season. They were missing Paul Arters, Eli Adamakis, Tim Schock will be making his return later in the season That's and true. providing more D-line stability. I mean, I hear what you're saying. I think Andrew Roy was a particularly large loss for them on Saturday night for Minnesota, but Chicago will also be adding talent as the season progresses. They will. Oh, Chica Chicago does not need to do anything all that quickly. Their next game isn't until June, literally, against Detroit. Uh, they have four weeks to game plan for the mechanics, so we'll see what kind of wrinkles they come up with. Uh, Minnesota needs to get in gear fast. They got road challenges at Dallas, at Madison the next three weeks. So, you know, it's a little early to say they're staring 0 and 3 right in the face, but. Uh, if they don't shape up quick, they uh, they very well could be uh, with nine games to go. All right, Adam and Daniel, we bounced around a bunch of different topics, but appreciate the time as always. That'll do it for Toss Up tonight. Coming up still on the show, Up Line and Out of Bounds with Matt Smith and Antoine Davis. But first, it's another Cohen's Cut. What's up, AUDL fans? Daniel Cohen here with this week's Cohen's Cut. Today we're going to be looking at the Chicago Union and how they transition out of zone defense to limit opposing offenses. Now, zone defenses can be really effective creating backfield pressure by facilitating double teams, stopping easy in cuts, and generally just forcing a lot of throws, including difficult throws over the top or through the zone. If they're broken though, zones can run into trouble when offenses are able to string together multiple throws without letting the zone reset. So instead of letting this weakness hurt Chicago's zone defense, last season they did a lot of transitioning out of zone into matchup-based defense once the opposing offense got moving. So in this example, we see Chicago set up a 2-3-2 zone with the Flyers backed up in their own end zone. For the first five throws, the zone is mostly doing its job. Carolina hasn't gained significant yards, the front of the zone is maintaining pressure on the handlers, and the defense hasn't gotten out of position at all. It's not until Saul Yannick throws a hammer over the top to the far side of the field that the zone is really broken, and it's this throw that triggers the switch into matchup defense. So, rather than having the two defenders at the front of the zone chase the disc all the way to that far sideline, the wing defender on that side takes the nearest cutter, the two handler defenders remain on the handlers, and the rest of the zone takes the nearby matchup in each player's vicinity. Part of what makes the transition so smooth is communication, and also the team defaulting to taking away the biggest threat in each player's immediate area. Before coming up to guard Jacob Fairfax, watch Sam Kaminsky drop back onto Henry Fisher until he's sure there's a defender that can take that matchup. This transition slows the pace of the offense. If they hadn't transitioned, the offense could have taken advantage of the out of position zone after that initial hammer. Chicago controlled the pace of their opponents all season with this approach. 
slow down the game with zone defense initially, then stop the offense from running through the zone by transitioning back into matchup defense once it breaks. After slowly progressing downfield, the Flyers ultimately force a throw into tight matchup D in the red zone, where Drew Swanson lays out past Henry Fisher for the Union block. Thanks for watching. Be sure to join me next time for another Cohen's Cut. What's up, AUDL world? Welcome to another regular season episode of Upline and Out of Bounds. Uh, today, I'm joined uh, with a very exciting guest. Call him a, a friend of the show, alumni of the hustle, uh, AUDL superstar, highlight machine, whatever you want to say, Antoine Davis. How's it going, Antoine? Doing great. How about you, Matt? I am doing well. Uh, happy to have you on the show and uh, ready to get right into it. So. Uh, with that, we're going to hop right into the intro and kick it off. So first question for you, hometown. Hometown is Arlington, Virginia, just outside, cool. of, just outside of D.C., yeah. Cool. Current age? 28, but turning 29 this month. Ooh, getting up there, but right in I that know. prime. <laughs> uh, did you attend college? If so, what degree or major did you pursue? Uh, I went to Virginia Tech and I eventually found myself um, graduating in human nutrition, foods, and exercise. So it's like kind of a pre-med because I thought I was going to be a doctor, but I don't like school that much. That's very fair. Uh, yeah, with that in mind, what are you, uh, what's your current occupation, career, day job? What are you up to these days? Um, so what mainly pays the bills is I'm a, a model. And so I kind of go around the, uh, not the world, but uh, uh, go, go around the country doing sh shots for different companies. Um, but my passion project is definitely uh, life coaching. And that began around, actually in the middle of uh, shutdown. And that's like kind of really turns my gears um, as a look. Very cool and good luck with all of that. It's exciting yeah. stuff. Uh, flipping over to Frisbee side, uh, position on the field. You know, just a uh, playmaker pretty much, you know, but uh, uh, officially it's uh, just like a uh, downfield uh, initiator for offense and um, for mainly Empire just sh shutting down their uh, initiator. Yeah, I would have said hybrid for sure. <laughs> uh, why don't you give us your ultimate origin story? Yeah, this one's, uh, I think, a pretty funny one. Um, I used to talk mess about uh, Ultimate all the time. And um, and it was, an, I got introduced to it in high school and all my friends played it. And I was like kind of your typical jock and playing football, basketball, running track. And my friends got tired of me talking mess. So they invited me to uh, come to practice. I was like, all right, I'm gonna dog y'all at your sport. And I went and they dogged me, but I absolutely loved it. And it was like a Tuesday or Wednesday. And that weekend, I went to my first tournament. And by senior year, so that was sophomore year, by senior year, I quit all my sports to play Ultimate year round. Man, that's so awesome. So, uh, you know, from a hater all the way to the pros. Uh, <laughs> last one here, favorite AUDL moment so far? Hmm. It still is that um, 2019 AUDL All-Star Game, as you were a part of. It was just such a great atmosphere, just all around, you know, immense talent. And it was just like such a pleasure just to be a part of the experience. Absolutely. Uh, definitely one of my favorite moments, minus, you know, one small detail at the end there for us. But, uh... <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, now that the audience knows you a little bit better, we're going to jump into today's game section, which is ooh, a classic here. GOATS stands for greatest of all time. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple a couple categories. They might be quirky. They might be whatever. You tell me, you know, who, what, when, where, what in that category you think is the greatest of all time. Uh, so we're going to start it off here with I know you're a fan of The Office. So, greatest of all time, character from The Office. Ooh. I mean, you gotta go with Michael, right? Like, he makes the show and it definitely took a huge dip when he left. 
And I, I watched it probably over 20 times over, and I still laugh at all his lines. He is the MVP, it feels like. So. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> all right. I like that. Moving along, but sticking in entertainment. Greatest of all time, R&B artist. Of all time. Of all time. Of all time. Uh, I might get some flack for this, but I got to go with Justin Bieber. I love me some Justin Bieber. I have like over 50 songs of him in my Spotify library, so J Biebs. All right, I'm not gonna hate. I'll leave it to the other people. I respect that. Uh, moving right along then. Uh, greatest of all time, superhero. Ooh. Greatest of all time. I mean, I either have to go with Batman or Iron Man. And if I had to choose Iron Man. All right. Sure. Yeah. All right. That was like, I, for me, that was kind of the first Marvel movie that really set it off. That was a oh, great yeah. Iron sure. Man. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, well, I appreciate you playing along uh, with the game. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. But before we get out of here, uh, any last shout outs you want to give? Uh, just shout out to uh, Game Point Performance. They um, been I've been a co- coach with them for several years and have made me the athlete that I am today. So if you're looking for anything uh, to improve your performance, Game Point, for- Game Point Performance is the way to go. All right. And uh, watching you on the field, I certainly believe it. And I know I speak for the rest of the AUDL. We're looking forward to this New York and Boston matchup this weekend. But for now, back to Evan. All right, Matt, thanks as always. Good to hear from Antoine. And a reminder that you can watch bonus content from every episode of Upline Out of Bounds exclusively on AUDL.TV. For now, though, time to say goodnight. My thanks to Adam Ruffner, Daniel Cohen, Mike Lund, Matt Smith, Antoine Davis, and, of course, a big thank you to Luke Johnson, our editor extraordinaire. Thanks to you as well for tuning in tonight. Our March to Championship Weekend continues with Week 3 starting this Friday. Triple header of Friday Night Ultimate, all live exclusively on AUDL.TV. But until then, I'm Evan Lepler. Thanks so much for checking out the show. Enjoy the Ultimate this weekend, everybody. And I'll talk to you again right back here next Wednesday.